pleased to have Francesca Polorossi from uh, Princeton University and who's going to tell us about uh, Mozart's functions and Sistine Academy. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, of course. And today I would like to, to talk about a recent joint work with Professor Sinai. So uh, this is a recent project, uh, which is somehow not related to my thesis dissertation, but nevertheless, um, I would like to, to tell you something about this. So it's about the Mebius function and some randomness in the Mebius function. Uh, it's like somehow philosophical, but let me give you an introduction. So what's the Mebius function? Well, this is classical function from number theory. Uh, zero if no, square three and minus one to the k if uh, n is k. Okay. Can you read I? Okay. So this is a classical function. So uh, our original motivation was basically a series of lectures by Professor Sarnak that we attended. And, and somehow, uh, the idea is that to what extent is this sequence, mu of n, random? So it's a sequence of zeros, ones, and minus ones. And I mean, so far, the, I mean, the, the sentence doesn't even make any sense. But to what extent we can think of this sequence as random? So, uh, for example, in terms of cancellations in this sequence, so it's, it's known that if you look at this, if you look at uh, the first n natural numbers, you look at, at this quantity, the fact that this is little o of capital N is equivalent to the prime number theorem. So there is some cancellation, and it is very, very hard to show this property. So if you want more cancellation, so you basically want um, n to the 1 half plus epsilon, and then you have the constant depending on epsilon. This is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. So this is very, very hard. So the cancellations in the function in the sequence mu are really crucial uh, in, in the context of number theory. So what's this heuristic? Um, the heuristic, so if you compare, uh, for example, if you look at the first uh, equality, basically we are summing a sequence mu of n times a constant sequence equal to 1. We can think of the following problem. You sum mu n against another sequence, sequence Cn. And you would like this to be little o of capital N. So if this is true, then we, we think of the sequence uh, C as being orthogonal to the sequence mu. And this is always why n goes to infinity. OK, what kind of sequences uh, should we be looking at? So sequences that we are, we are interested in are of the following type. You take a function. Let me, let me tell you what this is. So you take a point in some compact topological space. You take um, a map uh, from x to it into itself. And you take a function which is continuous on x. Continuous function, this compact space. And so basically, this is the, it's the trajectory of x under the map t. And then you, you sample this trajectory with the function f. So I guess I can write conjecture and I can attribute it to Sarnak. So uh, whenever, so if, let me call this, this is a dynamical system. Let me call this system uh, deterministic when the topological entropy of this system is zero. So if f s is deterministic, so 
topological entropy. Uh, then, then this is true. So, if you take a system which is zero topological entropy, you you do this, you create sequences in this fashion, then they are orthogonal to the Möbius function. This is like a conjecture, and is there a reason to believe this conjecture? Well, there are many reasons. So, uh, instances of the conjecture. So, of course, like I said, if you take x to be uh, finite, this is basically the prime number theorem or Dirichlet theorem. So this is true. So you basically integrate mu against like a, a sequence that takes finitely, uh, finitely many values in this way. Uh, if you another case, it's a consequence of result by Davenport. So basically, you look at the following. So your system here it is. R mod Z. So you look at a rotation of the circle. R alpha X is X plus alpha modulo 1. And, and basically, here you can look at the sum and then e to the 2 pi i and alpha mu of n. And so you call that n. So it's a classical result by Davenport. So basically, actually, he looks at the worst case. So you look at the supremum over alpha. And then you look at this quantity. And this is, you have some saving. So you have, uh, the tr of course, you start with capital N, which is the size of the sum. And then you can get any logarithmic saving. And the constant, I mean, if you want more savings, you have to change the constant. Okay, so this is Im this implies, of course, that this is little. It's a uh, little of capital. Okay. So we can make a lambda arbitrarily big, or yeah, you can save as much as you want. You just pay yeah. in the constant, and and those th those are rotations, so they have zero entropy. Uh, other system with zero entropy, so you can take system, dynamical system of the following type. You take G mod gamma and then T alpha. Let me tell you what this is. So G is a nilpotent a nilpotent group. You take gamma a lattice. And then you, you bit, and your, this is a translation, T of, I'm quotienting on this side, so it's, it's gamma x alpha, it's a multiplication from the other side. So that's your transformation. And so the conjecture is true for, uh, for S for this type of S, and this is a recent result by Green and Tau. Okay. So, so those are strong evidences. And actually, there is something between two and three, uh, the problem two prime. Uh, there is some recent result by Liu and Sarnak, uh, where you can take um, uh, Kronecker extension of these things, or you can take um, zero entropy affine automorphisms. Anyway, so so there are intermediate results, and it's open. The conjecture is open for so-called um, Ratner sequences. So it's the same as as above, where G is semi-simple. 
example, if you look at SL2Z, SL2R, if you look at this dynamical system, it's, it is unknown. Yes. Yeah, in this case, those are all cases of zero entropy. Let me tell you, that for example, when you, when you look at, um, if, if G is the Eisenberg group, uh, and those are, those are, gamma is the integer points of the Eisenberg group, basically, from three, you get uh, e to the two pi i and square alpha, mu of n. And so you get, So, so green and tau in particular implies this one. So you, you see that going from n alpha to n square alpha. This was already known to Dimitrovic, I suppose. This is already Dimitrovic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, a much stronger result. Yeah. That well, it's a yeah, but those are like nil sequences. Those are called, these sequences are called nil sequences. Well, make a small remark. Absolutely. I, d I haven't seen anything like that. Because it's one of the situations where the standard technique does not permit it. Yeah. Well, that must be. That should be clarified. It's easier than that to prove it's easier than the interval exchange. Yeah, I mean, uh, interval exchange is somehow here. The rest of the sequence is mixing all over the big function. This yeah. is also not really important to make the interval. Now that's false. It is essential. Yeah, that that yeah. The moral of the story is you can correlate something analogous against something simple. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to make that complicated. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And uh, another instance in a slightly different uh, setting, another instance of this so called run, uh, Mobius randomness law, we can refer to this as uh, Mobius randomness law, uh, it's a result by Bourguin. Um, where you, you use mu as a, you pretend that mu is a random potential and you look at uh, Schrodinger equation with this random potential which is not really random but it's mu and he proves something about the, the growth of the, of the eigenfunction. So it, it's it's a description of localization. Mu yeah, is uh, Anderson localization is open as far as I understand from that. So that's and presumably very, very hard to do. Okay, let me. This was a motivation so far. Uh, well, other motivation for studying, uh, other motivation for studying the sequence mu is of course if you, if you look at mu n and to the s, uh, <coughs> you you get one over zeta. And if you look at mu square and n to the s, you get zeta of s, zeta of 2s. So connection with zeta function, so of course it's, it's, it's a motivation itself. OK, our setting. Our setting from this point of view is completely like uh, degenerate and somehow e extremely uh, simple, even like very, very naive, but that's what we can do. So we take a set, which is a set of ends that are written as powers, as products of the first n primes with some indices, with some exponents. So you look at all possible numbers you can generate with the first n primes. Okay? Fair enough. So this set has obviously two to the m elements. The largest in this ensemble is the product of all 
the first prime numbers, which when m grows is basically e to the m log m 1 plus little o of 1. So there are only there are exponentially many points, but there are the largest one is super exponentially big. So somehow this set is very sparse. It has to be sparse. Okay. So that's what it is. And let me make a remark. If you look at the set of of, of square free numbers, if you look at this, so which is somehow the, the usual ensemble uh, where you sum in this case. Uh, N square free. The Q stands for like the German quadrat phrase, so that's standard notation. So then if you look at Q PM is sitting inside omega M. So the f if you, the standard ensemble up to PM is sitting inside here. And the cardinality of this is approximately, when M is large, is uh, 6 over pi square log PM, um, PM, which let's say log M times M. But here it is 2 to the M. So somehow this, this ensemble is sitting inside the bigger ensemble, but it's very, very tiny compared to the size of the bigger ensemble. This is a side remark. Okay. Okay, so what we do we do with these ensembles? Uh, well, let me remark that over this ensemble, the previous discussion becomes basically uh, trivial. So if you, if you look at, uh, if instead of summing all the numbers 1 up to n, you sum all the numbers in our ensemble, and you look at this quantity, this is identically 0, because they are like half numbers have mu equal to 1, and half numbers have mu equal to minus 1. So this is trivial. Um, so somehow this question doesn't, doesn't make any sense anymore. And I wanted to mention something else. Um, and obviously other things like in the context of like Davenport or Vinogradov, you can, you can look at the V of n e to the 2 pi i let's say n to the any power n to the d k over l k is a rational k over l is a rational number this will be identically zero for sufficiently large for sufficiently large m so somehow this kind of sums are like uh, they become much easier and they you see, there is no difference here between d equal to 1, d equal to 2. So this ensemble has, has a lot of symmetry, has a lot of structure. That's, that's the message I want to convey as, as a set. Now I want to treat this. I mean, so far as a set, we don't take into account the size of the P, which is not generally pure combinatorial. Yeah, this is pure, yeah, so far it's purely combinatorial. Later. Yeah, I mean, you're going to bring in the size of the prime. Exactly. So later. Uh, I mean, we can find s some sort of, uh, so in general, if you look at mu of n times some function f of n, some sequence f of n, and you, you look at uh, any uh, in our ensemble, then the equivalent of your conjecture will be, well, this sum is little o of 2 to the m. Okay? So we cannot quite get this, but we do get this for certain sequences where the function depends on m. So this gives you some weaker form of, of this conjecture in a different setting, where the set has more structure. So again, later. I'll mention this later. Now I want to look at this omega as an ensemble, namely as a probability ensemble. As a, so I want to put, put a probability measure on omega m. And the idea is that you want to punish these big guys for being so large somehow. And so what you do, the probability that depends on m over on, on of the number n is basically 1 over n. So here the bigger you are, the, the smaller uh, 
your mass is. And then you have to normalize it, so this is a probability measure. Okay, so, so Zm is somehow the sum n over of 1 over n. And what you, can, you can compute what's the asymptotic of Zm. Uh, you basically use um, Merton's formula. It, it, I mean, it's, it's easy. So let me just tell you the result. There is some, it grows like log Pn, or if you want, log m. And the constant is e to the gamma, Euler's constant, and zeta of 2 here. Okay. So the log, uh, so the fact that this Zm is growing, and the fact that I use Zm should like psychologically suggest that this resembles like partition function in, in statistical mechanics. And when you look at, in statistical mechanics, when you take thermodynamical limit, the partition function goes to infinity. So this is the connection somehow. And, okay, so, so what do I want uh, to say now? Okay, so how about the exponent, the new j? So this probability distribution on n induces a probability distribution on the new j, and it's very easy to compute. What's pm of new j equals 0? What's pm of new j equal 1? So this is basically 1 over 1 pj, and this is 1 over 1. This is a simple computation. So this. So, sorry, I'm lost track of that. So what, what's the new j? The new j are the exponents of oh, the prime. Okay. Or basically, they, are, they tell you whether the prime, yeah. the pj, yeah. the jth prime appears or not. So this tells you that the larger j, the smaller the chance of, of the prime appearing. Okay, so somehow this model is generating, if you think of a random number generated from this ensemble with this probability measure, it will have basically small prime factors according to this. Uh, is there a specific reason you've chosen this one upon n? Is, is, that, is, there, is that a natural thing? This one? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a multiplicative. <laughs> Yeah. Problem, yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. So you. I guess the passage. Yeah. The, and, and in a second, I'll, I'll explain why this thing somehow concentrates at least a positive mass of our probability distribution on the standard ensemble. So, so our ideal goal is saying something about probabilistic about this big ensemble tells us actually something about the smaller ensemble sitting inside. That's the general philosophy. We are still very far, but we can, that's the main philosophy. Okay, so those are, the new j's are uh, independent random variables, but they are not identically distributed. Okay, I'll, I'll comment about that in a second. Okay, so now I want to look at look at n in our ensemble. And the way I want to write n is uh, n equals e, and then I look at sum j from 1 to m, new j log pj. Okay, so this somehow is the quantity that we look at. We look at this uh, quantity in a logarithmic scale. But this is not normalized yet. So to somehow motivate our normalization, um, let, me, let me tell you something about, again, statistical mechanics. So we have a probability distribution on this set. You can compute its entropy. So if you compute the entropy of the probability distribution pi m, it's, it's, a, it's honestly like a very short computation, but I'm not going to go through it. Maybe I'll do it. Let me write the definition. So you look at pi m of n, log of pi m of n. Okay. After computation, you find you find out that this guy is basically log p m. So log m basically, and there is some uh, higher order terms and dub some double log. 
log log PL. So this is the, the entropy growth uh, is, is growing. So we have a growth of the entropy. And now as a statistical mechanic, it's, it's natural to study, to look at the entropy per degree of freedom or the entropy per particle somehow. So what this is, oops. So the entropy per particle or per degree of freedom is minus uh, log pi m of n over h of pi m. So this is the entropy per degree of freedom. So if you compute this using the, the previous result, this is asymptotic to the sum j from 1 to m, nu j log pj, which is basically log n so far. And then you have to divide by log pm. So, I'm, so this somehow psychologically motivates that this log pm should be the right scaling. This should be the right quantity to divide by. And indeed it is. So let me, let me tell you our theorem. So define Zm of n is j1 to m nu j log pj over log n, log pn, which is basically log n over log pn. This is our random variable, and n is uh, random with respect to the probability measure in our ensemble. Okay, so theorem, say theorem one. So the um, Zm converges in distribution, let's say in law, to some random variable. There is a limiting uh, random variable. And this quantity, and okay, and this is um, how to write it. So uh, the characteristic function and the characteristic function of zeta infinity, which is like the expectation of e to the I lambda zeta infinity is usually denoted by phi lambda. And uh, it has the following form. So basically, in the proof of this, this quantity, we actually find explicitly the, um, basically the Fourier transform of this probability distribution. So let me, uh, if we're writing this. So those are probability distributions. Those are random variables defined on R plus. So this guy is defined on R plus. Those are probability distribution on R plus. Okay, so the Fourier transform of this probability distribution on R plus looks like this. So it's exponential and then integral from zero to one e to the i lambda v minus one over v dv. So we have a very, very explicit formula for the, for the um, probability distribution, for the Fourier transform of the probability distribution. And then we, we looked at this, and somehow this, was, this is a known probability distribution. It's known, and it is so-called Dickman the distribution. And on R plus, it looks like this. So you have, it's constant from zero to one. And then it decays basically super exponentially, like Poisson. The tail is like Poisson. And this constant here, it's e to the minus gamma. And this e to the minus gamma is chosen so that the whole area is one. So uh, 
notice that somehow, wh what is this uh, segment 0, 1 in terms of our original problem? Segment 0, 1 corresponds to like zeta n being between 0 and 1, namely n being between 0 and pm. So pm to the 0 and pm to the 1. pm to the 0, pm to the 1. So you have to think of this as a logarithmic scale as exponents of pm. So pm to the 0, pm to the 1, pm to the 2. So if you write this interval in terms of the original ensemble, it's much longer. Okay? That's that somehow this comes from here. Okay, so this piece of the probability distribution corresponds precisely to the standard ensemble. And it turns out to test positive probability, like about 0.5. You can compute this. Okay, so let me tell you something about this probability distribution. Uh, well, first of all, you can, you can compute asymptotics of this guy at infinity. It will decay very poorly because this guy is a jump. It will basically decay like constant over lambda, absolute value of lambda. And we, we have information about that. It's not a big deal. Um, I, I'm not telling you anything about the proof except that it's, it's elementary in the sense that you take the Fourier transform of Zm, uh, of zeta m, and then you, you manipulate the sums, you use Riemann sums, and eventually you can write a Riemann sum as some integral, and then you're done. It's, it's, it's by hand, you have like 12 error terms to keep track of, but it works. And, and it is not quantitative. So I cannot control right now the rate of convergence, which will be helpful in other problems we have, but that's what it is. And uh, the tail, so um, let me call this guy rho. Uh, rho t, actually, let me use rho e to the minus gamma rho t. So rho is usually the notation for the Dickman de Bruyne function. So I make it a distribution by dividing by the right thing, which happens to be e to the minus gamma. So rho of t, it's uh, like exponential uh, minus t log t plus higher order terms. So basically, it tells you that it decays at infinity like Poisson. It's super exponential at infinity. So let me tell you a bit about the history of this Dickman de Bruyne function. Okay. So this function appears naturally in the theory of so called smooth numbers. Numbers. So the classical notation, I think, it's capital psi of x, y. So what is this? You look at the following quantity. You look at the cardinality of, of the set of the numbers. Uh, so numbers, let's say, z, which are less than x. And if you have a prime that divides z, then this prime is less than y. So this is the cardinality of the set of those numbers less than x whose prime factors are less than y. Yeah, y is smaller. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and basically that's somehow the, the, the real question is how small can y be in terms of x so that this quantity has a limit? Or what kind of limit? Yeah. Exactly. I, let me tell you what these are. So already Dickman in the 30s proved that if you take psi of x and y is a, a power of x, so it's better to use like one over u. So like one, yeah, whatever. Okay. Think of u as one half. Okay. Then. This is asymptotic to x, so basically you expect this number to grow with x, times rho of u. So if y is related to x in this uh, power-like fashion, 
then the asymptotic of this number is this. So here we are counting those numbers. This is not related to the previous problem. Let me just tell you something about this. Okay. And then the, the range, the, as, you, as you mentioned, there are different regimes. The range of y's that exhibit the same, the same behavior has been enlarged. So there was De Bruyne who proved that he can take y bigger than um, exponent log x to some power, 5 over 8 plus epsilon. OK, so here I'm saying that if you take x of the type y uh, to the power u, and you allow y to be here, then this is true. Then this is true. So again, in this regime, this is true. And then there is another result by Hildebrand, where you allow y to be even smaller somehow. So it Component, and then here you have a double log, different power, 5 over 3 plus epsilon. This is again true. However, you cannot like crack it down too much because when you take psi of x log x, so here y is very small compared to x, then this is not true. Somehow the asymptotic there is not governed by the Dickman de Bruyne distribution. And this is a result by Erdos. And this grows like some constant log 4. And then you have log x over log log x. So somehow, this Dickman de Bruyne distribution uh, function, so here is a function. There is no e to the minus gamma here. So this function tells you something about the asymptotic of this counting function, because you count how many such, uh, how many z's are there. But in this regime, the Dickman de Bruyne function doesn't play the role of the limiting counting anymore. But now, let's look at our case. In our case, what we do, our case, so in our case we have omega m. So the largest guy, which is basically the x, is p1 pm, which is somehow e to the m log m, 1 plus little of 1. That's the large guy. And then we allow the, the primes to be of order pm, which is m log m. So in our case, indeed, we are looking at x log x, x log x. And then we intersect with the set of square free numbers. So in our set, we do get the Dickman de Bruyne, de Bruyne distribution. Here you don't. The reason being that in our set, we weigh, we weigh the numbers. Here you count the numbers. So somehow, w the weights we put on our numbers, this probability distribution that we put on our numbers, allows us to recover this, this regime even though we, are, we have this relation between x and y. So somehow we recover a classical regime thanks to like, the probability distribution we chose. Instead of like, counting, we use this 1 over n distribution. So this is somehow the, the connection. random process which corresponds to the representation of the primes in the decomposition of the numbers randomly sampled from that. Okay. So you have some correlated process. Yeah. Which by the Chinese the remainder theorem for uh, as n tends to infinity locally converges to a product measure. Mm -hmm. Are you in essence studying that measure? Mm. Uh, in, uh, interchanging the limits in effect? We are basically so here we start with something that's already independent. So, if you look at the joint distribution of primes for any fixed number of them, within 
within the integrated Africa development and then complete their distributed asymptotic independence with this particular mm -hmm. one group. So you're asking whether this is taking one limit first? I, 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 I've never thought about the question, this probability distribution in these terms, but I, I don't see why it should be the same. So I haven't thought about it, but it might be, but I don't see an obvious reason why why this should be the case. Can, can you explain again relative why the return of the existence of the than the one you were expecting? Because here we are not counting the the points in the same. We are waiting. So it, it really has to do with designing another ensemble. Yeah, we are it depends yeah. on this probability distribution that we put why here. I mean, you can change, for example, this this thing and put like another power here, but if you like put a, a large power, then the the your partition function will not grow anymore. So, so yeah, how many how many what fraction of numbers are divisible by t? The answer is I guess one over t. Asymptotic. Yes. Yes. And if you take any finite number of such primes and ask for this equation, then asymptotically it converts to a product. To the product measure. So you want to say that the, the one should not be here. No, it's OK. But no, this is actually a good, good point. We, we haven't thought about this in this term, but it's actually very interesting. So uh, we'll, we'll look into that. Whoops. So how much time do we have left? 15 minutes. So let me mention some more refined results. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll mention that. Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, okay. So let let me let me summarize one part that I was planning to have longer. But um, so like uh, remark this this limiting probability distribution. This uh, Dickman de Bruyne is infinitely divisible. Infinite divisibility doesn't play a big role here, but uh, it's somehow an, an, a nice feature of this limiting distribution. Infinite, infinite divisibility was very popular uh, in the 30s. There is like a whole theory by Kinchin, Levy, Kolmogorov, and so. And somehow we, we didn't find this uh, this statement in the literature, and we actually proved it by hand, and it's it's very simple. It's just a remark. Okay, so. Now you can you can look at this probability distribution, and then you can you can try. So if you fix an interval here, let's say a b, and you look at the probability that our z zeta m is between a and b, this converges by theorem one to e to the minus gamma, the integral from a to b, rho u du, and we can say a lot about rho. Rho is like a classical function. You can define it. Uh, once you have the definition from 0, 1, you can recover the definition from 1 to 2, and then 2 to 3. So here the function is continuous but not c1. Between 2 and 3, here the function is c1 but not c2, c3 but not c4, and so on. So we, we know a lot about this rho. It decays super exponential. Yeah, I can, I can write that. Yeah, it satisfies an integral equation. Satisfies a so-called uh, delay, yeah, so delay. Yeah, exactly. So basically, you can recover the value here, knowing the value there. Okay. So uh, once you know this, you can ask, what if instead of the interval, uh, fixed interval a b, we look at delta k 
k delta k plus 1, where delta k is basically little k over capital K. So we chop this interval in, I mean, we look in, we look in here because this is the classical ensemble, OK? So in this regime, the, the theorem should not work because we, we don't have fixed interval. We are like shrinking interval. We want to know, basically, to what extent the theorem still works for shrinking interval. And so you can write down the following thing. So it's this probability. So you have a shrinking interval of that type. And then you subtract what it should be. So it should be e to the minus gamma and then 1 over k. Because in this regime, the, the limiting distribution has like constant e to the minus gamma. And then you basically look at this quantity. OK? So this is the error term in the, in the in theorem 1 for shrinking interval. OK? So ideally, I mean, the hope is that this E and KK is little of 1 over K. So the error term should be smaller than this guy. Okay. Capital K, I fix capital K, and I chop this interval 0, 1 in capital K. Exactly, exactly. Now it's fixed, but then I want to pick capital K as a function of m. So for fixed K, I, I chop this interval 0, 1 in, in uh, segments of length 1 over K. And this is true for, so it's true that for fixed K, when m goes to infinity, this goes to 0, as you said. OK. So we have several like uh, several asymptotics. No, no, no. If k is fixed, you chop this interval in seven subintervals. Yeah, this is trivial. This is trivial. I want to have a similar. I want to estimate this e, this error, when k depends on on m. So let me let me write it here. And like I said, ideally, you would like this quantity. But we don't get that. So you can take k as a growing function of m. Okay? It's growing. And look at the following quantity. You look at the sum of these error terms. when k, little k, ranges from 1 to capital K. So we look at the sum of all the error terms in all different intervals, and then we average them. So we look at the average error. Okay? And I call this the average error. Okay? So that's the average error that you, you expect from theorem 1 in there. So a corollary of a theorem that I'm not e explaining, so let me say proposition, is the following. We have no absolute value. So we somehow, you would like this to be like centered. So you have as many errors positive as many like negative. So you, you basically look at the fluctuations. By definition. Oh no, we yes, yes, we do want the absolute value. You're right. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the was the was they would like cancel like telescopically, of course, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you look at this absolute value of this uh, sum, this average error, and then if you let k go to infinity. 
Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, if you take a function which is growing fast enough, so basically such that the limit when m goes to infinity of pm over kn log pm, so basically m log m over log n somehow, and this goes to some finite value, then this average uh, error is little o of this quantity. So if you choose k fast enough, this is not surprising. This is like some quantitative. I can say if you choose k fast enough, you're like sampling, you're averaging a lot, and these errors in average are small. And notice that this is very far from being like this. So, and the, the moral of the story is that here we are using a theorem for fixed intervals to, ha to estimate what happens for shrinking intervals. So to prove something stronger like this, we would need a limit theorem, like the version of theorem one for shrinking intervals that we don't have right now. But still, this gives us some estimate. Let me go back to your question. So what can we say about the, the original? So what we can do is the following. You can take, so back to Mebius randomness low. Uh, you can take the following sum. So we take me of n, and then gm of n, and gn gm is defined in this way, gm of t is f of log n over log pm. So you see this quantity, this log n over log pm is the same quantity that we look at in our limit theorem. Okay? And then we, we evaluate, basically you have to think of this as our rescaled ensemble. Instead of having the ensemble from 1, 2, 3, 5, uh, 6, 10, all the square free numbers. Instead of having this up to the large, the very largest one, which is the word the m to the m, we take, or rather, let's say, e to the m log n log m. So we take the log, so we kill this, and then we divide by the largest. We divide by, by log pn. So basically we divide by this. So now we are in a rescaled ensemble with many, many points here, and then fewer down here. And now I look at, in the rescaled ensemble, those are, this is basically this scale. Okay. Now f is a one periodic function. So basically we take a one periodic function in our rescaled variables, okay? And then we claim that this guy is zero. So somehow the symmetry of the ensemble is still giving us a lot of cancellation, okay? But this is a bit different from like the original problem because we are, this function is depending on, on m, but then then th this is one, one of the this is propositions. Uh, on the other hand, we can look at a function with very, very large period. We can do either period one or large period. We cannot do like period five. So large period, what does it mean? You, so you can decompose this function. I mean, in, in period one case, you decompose this function as f of k e to the two pi i uh, kt, okay, so this is the, 
the one periodic function. So if it is uh, two periodic, then you would like to put two here. Okay. So instead of looking at the, f the whole function, let's just look at the characters. Okay. Another proposition is the following. Let's look at the, the function uh, e, uh, the character basically, k over r log n log pm, okay, and then mu of n, and then the sum. Okay, so if I had this, I would have like fixed period like period R. Now I want to allow this numerator and denominator to depend on M. So in this sense, this is another G prime of M, another function uh, of M, similar to this. But it's, it's large period. So the statement is that if Km over Rm tends to 0, which means you have a very large, so both numerator and denominator grow. And basically, you have to think of the same thing as before with a very large, a very large period. So you're basically sampling your, your whole ensemble with, a, with some function of growing period. Yeah, somehow that's the reason why we got zero before. Beca because we are, we are exploiting the, the symmetries in this ensemble. There is a lot of structure. But here we, we destroy the structure here when you look at the larger period. So we, we have, so let's call this quantity i of m. It only depends on m now. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we have that i of m, if you take the log, it's less or equal than some constant, and then m over log m. That's the result. So basically, it, it tells that i of m is e to the big O of m over log m, which is saving compared to 2 to the m. So for certain, maybe a bit involved in like define functions or sequences, we can prove that we, you have some saving. But somehow, the, the philosophy is that the, this ensemble has a lot of symmetries, a lot of structure, and you have to like, work a bit hard to like, destroy them and get something which is non-trivial. Non-trivial being both 2 to the m and 0. So what you have to. I expect, I mean. Yeah, you have a product structure, yes. So you're just wasting the product of this type. Yes. So and you, you, take, you take the exponential, you take, that's why you take the log, and then you take, it's a sum of logs. So what you expect would be the right bound? I, I have no strong belief about this. So what was the, the reason? The, what's the philosophy now? Let me just tell you. And this is, this is not uh, done yet, but let me tell you. Why do we care about very long periods? So if we could make this function, which is one periodic, I mean, this is not the function. This function here is it's what it is. But if we can make a function which is instead of one periodic or two periodic, like period m, and so that, so let's say this is period m, so you have a function that repeats only after m. And somehow you want to make it very, very concentrated at the beginning. Exactly where your so where your zero one is. So where your original ensemble sits. So your original ensemble is what I called before Q of PM. Original ensemble is sitting here. So if you could if you could estimate this using a function like this, which is like seeing only the original ensemble. And of course, you're not happy with e to the m over log m. You would like uh, much better estimates. For a function that looks like this, if you could, number one, put a function like this, which implies constraints to the Fourier coefficients of this function. So you have combination of these guys. 
and you can improve the estimate to an extent that you get something meaningful for the small ensemble, this would, like, give, would give a way to attack the original question. This is very hard, this is very far from being true, but this is somehow the motivation that, that we were using to like, construct this periodic function over this rescaled ensemble, because the, the very initial part of this ensemble is the, the usual ensemble. That's somehow the philosophy. And just as a side remark, we have some more quantitative estimates about what happens to, to the sum of nu j. So let me just mention very quickly what, what we know. Uh, I think it's a classical result by Erdos that if you look at sum of nu j, then you have to subtract the expectation, which happens to be log log pm. And the variance is log log pm. This converges to normal. OK. So somehow, I mean, this is the statistics of the new j. But if you look at the sum of the new j between, let's say, m to the a and m to the b, so somehow it's a tail, then this is new j. You don't need to subtract anything, because here you expect only finitely many new j's to be non-zero. So this converges to Poisson of parameter log b over a. It's a very cute thing. And as a consequence of this, you can ask, what's the probability? Sorry, what's the probability in the bigger ensemble of a sub-ensemble? Something like this. So consequence of, both consequence of Poisson is that this is, this tends to 1. And it's exponentially fast. And it's probably like if you take the log, this is, uh, this is uh, if you take the log, whatever, it's exponentially fast. You can estimate how fast it happens. And if you, another consequence of this Poisson regime is if you take this or other power, this tends to one half. So somehow this tells you how this growing sets and the measures attached to them are like compatible with each other. And when you want to estimate things about one ensemble using a bigger one, this is the kind of phenomena that, that happen. This is, and again, this is like in the probabilistic side of this study, while what I was saying here is purely we are using this set as a set, not as a probability space. So there is like these two. Mm -hmm. Is it not reasonable to expect that you have, is it, would you expect a uniform estimate there? A uniform estimate? Well, instead of km over parallel, you just try to just take any uh, exponential on the real line. So you have e lambda. Mm -hmm. So this is going to factor like a product state if you have cosine lambda log p over mm -hmm. log pm, where you, you take a product of all these values. Okay. PM. So there should be some, this should be reasonably small, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, in, in, so no, I, I, would, I would expect. No, no, why, why this, uh, don't you expect a uniform result instead of? Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, like I said, this is a preliminary <laughs> result. We can prove that this, is, uh, this works for this case, and we have another more complicated family of cases where this is also true. And of course, I would expect that if you take a function of period, a fixed period. No, don't forget about period. Oh, you want to say take? OK. And it should be fine, right? Yeah, I would expect the constant to be independent. Uh, if, this is, if, if this is the right estimate, I would expect the constant not depend on, on, on alpha. Yeah. And uh, probably one can improve this. So you didn't prove that? Because I mean, even if you tell product, and likely, no, we, we haven't. We haven't. This is the product. If, if you work out the size of it and you divide by two to the power, yeah, yeah. The no, no, I understand. I understand. Yeah. So it should be free of the estimate, it should be No, no, I understand that. But we just haven't looked at it. Because we were looking at this, like the motivation I said, we look at this period. But th that would take care of the question you had. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I, I understand. Yeah, but yeah we, we have, this is a recent thing. So we haven't, we haven't looked at this. 
quantities in detail. So, if you have any more questions, thank you. Thank you very much.